In this video, I want to explore more of the properties of binomial coefficients. Um, just as a reminder, in our lecture series, Math 3120, we typically have the format that the first video in a lecture is about a new mathematical topic. Uh, the second video then usually focuses on logical methods, and the third video gives us some advice about mathematical communication. Um, in lecture 18, because this is the last lecture, on combinatorics. I actually switched the order of these. Our logical topic came first um, because we'd explored some more examples of combinatorial proof that we had first learned about in lecture 17. But in this video, the previous video for lecture 18, we exclusively use combinatorial proof to study identities about binomial coefficients. And so in this video, I want to explore some more about binomial coefficients leading to Pascal's triangle and the so-called binomial theorem. So let's review some of the properties, identities we already know about binomial coefficients. So let's take this first one. And this is how this is the first one we found in our lecture series, that n choose k is equal to n factorial over k factorial times n minus 1 factorial, which that second one's in the denominator as well. Um, this honestly was our definition of the binomial coefficients in our lecture series, how we defined it. And remember where this thing come from. We were previously counting permutations for which we had these falling factorials. We had n fall by k, which was n factorial over n minus k factorial. And this counts, these falling factorials count permutations, which were ordered list of distinct elements. Now, if we want to move from ordered list to unordered list, we could forget the ordering, which then the division principle allowed us to divide the falling factorial by a k factorial. And then we forgot the order of the, of the list. This makes an unordered list of distinct elements, which is what we call a combination, which is essentially just we're counting sets at that point. And that's where we got this formula. And we introduced the symbol in choose k to then to count those combinations. Uh, but we're also discovering there's a lot more things about combinations, about binomial coefficients that we can learn about. Like in the previous video, we proved using combinatorial proof this identity right here, that n plus 1 choose k is equal to n choose k minus 1 plus n choose k. And this is one of our first examples in our lecture series of a recursive formula. So I want to say a moment about this idea of recursion. In the very next unit, starting with lecture 19 of this lecture series, we're going to start talking about integers, which will include topics like mathematical induction and recursion. Um, if you haven't used, heard the term before, like if you've done some programming, computer programming, you probably are familiar with the recursion. But recursion is a is a is an algorithm to calculation where you use the predecessors of a numerical sequence that, that to then compute um, the successors in that sequence. So if you think of like the binomial coefficients as a collection of numbers, it's it, there's two num there's two uh, parameters, two variables in play here. There's the number n, and then there's also the the number k there. So it's a, it's a it's a double number sequence, but nonetheless, it's a sequence of numbers. What this formula right here tells us is that we can compute the n plus 1 uh, level binomial co coefficients using the n level binomial coefficients. So if we know all of the binomial coefficients where the top number is n, we can then use them to compute all of the binomial coefficients where the top number is n plus 1. And remember with sets, this top number tells you the size of the set, the bottom number tells you the size of the subset. If we can count all of the subsets of a set of size n, we can use that to count subsets of sets of size n plus 1, okay? But then also, because there's a second parameter, we have to have some type of initial value. Uh, well, actually, this is true for any recursive sequence. We have some type of recursive relationship. It tells us how the next generation is affected by the previous generation. But we also have to have some initial value, something that gets us started. And with binomial coefficients, it we also have discovered um, with our recursive relationships here, well, even without the recursion, that if you take n choose 0, that is equal to 1. Because n choose 0 is the number of subsets of a set of cardinality n that itself has zero elements, which there's only one such subset. It's the empty set. That's the only one. Now, conversely, um, that's equal to n choose n, right? Which, of course, that would say we want all subsets of a set of size n that contains in elements, that would be the whole set itself. There's only one such set, and hence these are both equal to one. Now also remember another identity we've seen previously is that if you take n choose k, that's the same thing as n choose, uh, n, choose n minus k. 
So choosing elements for a set is the same thing as choosing elements for its complement. And so with these identities in hand, uh, we can put these together and actually work to compute some very interesting recursive formulas. And so let's do some example of those right now. So using these identities you now see on the screen, we can do things like zero choose zero, that's equal to one uh, by this property right here. We can do one choose zero, which is one, um, we also get one choose one, which is equal to one. Again, using these properties right here. Uh, we can do choo two choose uh, zero, which is equal to one. Um, now we get to something like two choose one. How can we deal with that one? Well, that's where this recursion comes into play here. So by recursion, two choose one is the same thing as one choose zero plus one choose one, which is one plus one, which is equal to two. Uh, and then finally, two choose two is equal to one. All right, let's do the next row here. Three choose zero is equal to one. Three choose one, by recursion, this is the same thing as two choose zero plus two choose one, for which two choose zero was one. We can see that two choose one was two, which gives us three. Uh, next one, we're gonna get three choose two, which is actually equal to three choose one uh, by this identity. So that's also three. And then lastly, we get three choose three, which is equal to one by our identities. Let's do one more example of this. Let's do the four row, just to illustrate. I'll do a different color to make it stick out a little bit better, because uh, I'm afraid this is all blurring to us on the screen. If you take four choose zero, that's equal to one uh, by the identity we've seen. Then you can take four choose one by recursion. This is the same thing as three choose zero plus three choose one which is then equal to one plus three, which is equal to four. And one can actually prove in greater generality that if you take n choose one, this is always equal to n. Um, because of what we're doing right now, uh, of course you can also use the standard formula that was on the on the top of the screen with the factorials as well. Uh, four choose two, that's an interesting one. Four choose two is going to be, again, we can use the formulas uh, using the factorials, but if we use this recursion here, this is three choose one plus three choose two, which we know all of these values. Three choose one is three. Three choose two is also three. So this is equal to six. Uh, the next one we have four choose three. We where this is the same thing as four choose one. So that's equal to four. And then lastly, you get four choose four, which is equal to one as well. So be aware that I'm just showing you how recursion works. I can use all of the previous numbers that I already know to help us compute the next numbers in the sequence there. And that's how recursion works. And the advantage of a recursive formula here is that if I know all of the previous information, I don't have to go through complicated calculations using factorials. I can actually compute simple sums. Um, but it would be very useful if I can organize this information in a more uh, a, a better structure. And that's what's going to lead to what we call Pascal's triangle. For which you can see Pascal's triangle, uh, at least the first couple rows illustrated right here. Um, so I, I'm going to put I'm gonna put my very first one at the very top of it. And this number represents zero choose zero, okay? And so then to keep things symmetric, I'm, the next row, which we had one choose zero and one choose one, that was one and one. We're gonna get one and one, and we're gonna put this in the midpoint right here. Then for the next row, we have the binomial coefficients with a two on top. You had two choose zero, you have two choose one, which was two. And then you have two choose two, which is one like so. So some of the observations we learned, um, when you take n choose zero, that's always one. And if you take n choose n, that's always a one. Every row of Pascal's triangle is gonna start and end with a one, okay? Another thing I wanna mention is that every row of Pascal's triangle is what we call a palindrome. It's read the same forward as it is backwards. Um, so guess which way I'm reading it, left to right. One, four, six, four, one. You don't know because it's the exact same forward and backward. And that's because of this identity, n choose k is the same thing as n choose n minus k. They would talk about previously that there's a symmetric property with regard to the rows of Pascal's triangle. And then another property that's really nice is the way that we've arranged it is the way that you compute a number, like say two, is you take the two numbers above it and add them together. One plus one is two. One plus three is four. Three plus three is six. Three plus one is four. Six plus four is 10. So I can actually compute, when you arrange it as a triangle, you can actually com compute the row involving the fives very, very quickly because you start with a one, you're gonna get one plus four, which is five. You're gonna get four plus six, which is 10. You're gonna get four plus six, which is 10. Four plus one was five, and you end with a one right here. I can actually do the sixth row pretty quickly as well. One, one plus five is six. Five plus 10 is 15. Um, 10 plus 10 is 20. And then the rest of it just repeats itself. 
15, 6, and 1. I can do the seventh row. 1, 7. We're going to take 6 plus 15, which is 21. We're going to take 35 plus 20, which is 35. And then at this point, it repeats itself because I'm halfway through. And then I can very quickly compute these binomial coefficients using the recursion if I have Pascal's triangle already constructed. Um, just again, a, a bit of reference here. I want to make mention that each of the rows in Pascal's triangle is marked off. Um, this will be the nth row. It's marked off by the number on the top of the binomial coefficient. And you can actually always see that as the second number in the row. So this is the first row, the second row, the third row, the fourth row, the fifth row, the sixth row, the seventh row, like so. Um, then each, it's a triangle, so it's not a matrix, so there's not really columns, but we can count the positions. There's the zero position, the one position, the two position, the three position. Um, there should be n plus one entries in the nth row, and that's your k value right there. So k equals zero. So this would be seven choose zero, seven choose one, seven choose two, seven choose three, seven choose four, seven choose five, seven choose six, and seven choose seven. So that's how you can read uh, Pascal's triangle. That's an important thing to be aware of. And it's just capturing uh, all of these binomial coefficients. Using recursion, we can compute these binomial coefficients very, very quickly. And there are some beautiful properties that one can see in Pascal's triangle. Like we said, you always start and end with a one. Um, if you look at that slant diagonal, you always get the integers like so. That's kind of fun. Um, another interesting property is that if you take that slant and then you just take the next position downward, um, that's actually the sum of that slant. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is actually equal to 10. Uh, similarly, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is equal to 15. Um, likewise, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 is equal to 21. Um, so it turns out that if this slant gives you the integers, the positive integers, then this slant gives you the triangle numbers, the sum of the integers, which we saw before, right? The triangle numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up to n is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2, which when you look at that, it's like, you know, that does look like, doesn't that look like um, n plus 1 choose 2? Ah, so the triangle numbers are hidden inside of uh, Pascal's triangle, but you actually don't have to just do the triangle numbers. If you take the sum of any of these slants, like take this one right here, 1 plus 4 plus 10, um, this is not the sum of consecutive integers, but nonetheless, the sum of those numbers is right there. 1 plus 4 plus 10 is 15, and it's not a coincidence. I wonder if there was an identity that we've already seen that could explain such a thing. Hmm. And if there isn't one, maybe there wasn't one, could one prove this, that the sum of these I, some, of, some of these binomial coefficients always adds up to be this one right there. Could one formalize that and work from there? That's an exercise I'm going to leave for the viewer here because my goal of introducing Pascal's triangles is, is to introduce us to expose to these magical properties that um, binomial coefficients have. But I also have to finish um, this discussion of binomial coefficients with the titular topic that is the binomial theorem. Because uh, the binomial theorem is actually where binomial coefficients get their name. So if we don't give them, uh, if we don't give them the time of day, then we've done ourselves a great disservice. So the binomial theorem um, is interested in the following: what we call a binomial uh, polynomial. Uh, that is, a, the, we want, we're interested in the binomial expansion of x plus a to the nth power. So x plus a is a binomial for which x is our variable, a is some, something else. It could be a number, I guess. You could have variables in it as well. It doesn't matter. But we have this binomial. We have two terms, x plus a, and we've raised it to a natural number power, so n. So it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. Um, and so we're interested in what does what are the coefficients of the terms as you expand it? Because you can go through like the distributive law, the, the FOIL process, and it gets a little bit messy. Can we predict what those coefficients are going to be without having to go through all of the nitty-gritty details? Now, again, I claimed n is a, is a natural number, so we start with 0. n plus a to the 0 power, that's just going to give you 1. Anything to the nth power is just 1. So you get the, 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 the constant coefficient has a coefficient of 1. Everything else has a coefficient of 0. If you take x plus a to the first power, that's just x plus a. So that means x will show up once. a will show up once. Okay, that was pretty easy. Uh, x plus a squared, this is where we can use the FOIL method. So this is going to be x plus a times x plus a, you're going to get x squared plus ax plus ax plus a squared. If you combine like terms, you end up with an x squared plus a, excuse me, 2ax plus a squared. Um, if you do x plus a cubed, um, what that notice that by definition is 
x plus a times x plus a times x plus a. But since we already did x plus a squared, we can introduce that for the first two, x squared plus 2ax plus a squared. Um, and then you times that by another x plus a. What we can then do is multiply that thing out, for which case you're going to get an x cubed. Uh, you'll get a, a uh, you'll get a, which one are we doing next? We're going to do 2ax times x, which is 2ax squared. We'll do an a squared times x, which we can see that one right there. Um, likewise, you're going to get a times x squared. Uh, we're going to get a times 2a, which will give us a 2a squared x. And then lastly, an a times a squared will give us an a cubed. Those are all the things, uh, those are all the, the six terms you get there. Combining like terms, there should be two x squares. There should be two x's. Um, and then so that combines to give us x squared plus 3ax squared uh, plus 3a squared x plus a cubed. Huh. Those numbers, if we look at just the coefficients, they look a little bit familiar to me. Let's do one more example. If you take x plus a to the fourth power, I claim that if you multiply it out and combine like terms, your coefficients will look like x to the fourth plus 4ax cubed plus 6a squared x squared plus 4a cubed x plus a to the fourth. And the coefficients there are going to be 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. 1, 3, 3, 1. 1, 2, 1. 1, 1, 1. All of those numbers look very, very similar. And if we were to bring back up the screen, I'm actually going to zoom it out so we can see them together. If you look at the coefficients of our binomial expansion, they exactly look like the numbers in Pascal's triangle. 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. Um, if you didn't pause the video, I would actually recommend that you do so you can check out this calculation yourself. And even if you're, if you're really bold, try x plus a to the fifth power. And I want you to convince yourself that that thing is going to be x to the fifth plus 5ax to the fourth plus 10a squared x cubed plus 10a cubed x squared plus 5 a to the fourth x plus uh, a to the fifth, right there. That's actually going to be the value it simplifies into at the very end. Kind of interesting. They're the coefficients from Pascal's triangle. So these are the binomial coefficients. And how does that work? Well, when you look at these expressions here, notice that when you look at the different monomials, basically the monomials, you're always taking uh, some collection of a's and some collection of x's so that the power, when you combine them together, adds up to be the power you're working on. So you either get the fourth power or the fifth power or whatever, depending on what you're looking at there. And how do you produce something like a squared x cubed? Or how do you get something like a cubed x squared? Well, that basically comes down to you have like an a, 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 x, x. That's a possibility. You could do a, a, x, x, a. You could do something like a, x, a, x, a. You have these lists, these binary list of terms um, for which you either choose an X or you choose an A. The length of the list has to be five, uh, but there's binary list. And so you can sort of ask yourself, well, okay, I want to look for all of the list which have three A's in them. Well, how many ways can you make a binary list with exactly three A's if there are five letters, uh, five, uh, five length total there? Well, basically you have to choose where the A's are gonna live. They can live in the first, second, and third position. They can live in the first, second, and fifth position. They can live in the first, third, and fifth position and all the other possibilities. You have to choose which buckets are gonna hold the A's and then by default, which buckets will hold the X's? And if I have five buckets and three A's I have to position, how many ways can you do that? That's going to be five choose three, is it not? And so the number of combinations you can create here is in fact these binomial coefficients. Let's formalize what we've been saying here and it ends with this so-called binomial theorem. Uh, the binomial theorem tells us that the expansion of the binomial x plus a to the power n is going to equal x to the n times n choose 0, a x to the n minus 1 times n choose 1, um, a squared times x to the n minus 2 times h n choose 2, and then all the way through. If you look at the most generic term in the sequence, you're going to get n choose k, and this will then look like n choose k times a to the k times x to the n minus k, and that's what each and every one of these terms looks like as you work through it. Um, you always have some combination of x's and a's so that their powers add up to be n. And then there's like a binomial coefficient, which the binomial coefficient is the coefficient of the a, how many times you chose the a. And so in more compact form, you get this right here. 
And so I do have the proof formally written out here, but honestly, we've gone through all of the details of it already. Um, with the binomial expansion, you have x plus a to the nth power. This will be x plus a times x plus a times x plus a. And so we're interested in what is the coefficient of a to the k times x to the n minus k. Now, it's very possible the coefficient could be zero because if that, if that uh, monomial is not possible to create, you could get a zero right there. That's a possibility. Now, how do you form a C? Well, you're going to get C is going to be the sum. Um, it's going to be formed. The coefficients be sum because you add together all the like terms. You have to grab all of the A k's, X to the N minus k's that show up in the product. And how many of those you get is what C is going to be. Well, how many such terms are there? Well, to produce such a monomial a to the k, x to the n minus k, you're looking for words, like because of the products, as you foil out the x plus a times x plus a times x plus a, you're going to get some words, some combinations of x's and a's, like we were considering beforehand. Because the multiplication is commutative, I can always move all of the a's to the front and all of the a's to the end. And so that's how you produce these monomials. So we have to count how many binary words, how many binary sequences can we form with k a's and n minus k x's. But since in the end, we just, um, we're just going to put them back, right? All of the a's to the front, all of the x's in the bottom. Uh, it really would just have to count that which, which positions were the a's in originally. And that comes down to these binomial coefficients that we already chose. So the number of such words is going to be n choose k. And therefore, the coefficient is going to be n choose k as well. And so that then gives us the binomial formula, which we had up here, that the, uh, sorry, there's some K's and J's mixing up here. They, all of those J's should be K's inside of our formula. The, the, the binomial expansion comes to these binomial coefficients. And this is why we, in fact, call them binomial coefficients, because they're the coefficients of this binomial expansion. Even though we can use them to count so many other things, it's a very, very important tool for the binomial theorem. Let's just do a quick example of this real quick. Uh, so let's use the binomial theorem to expand x plus 2 to the fifth power. So what that's going to look like is we end up with a 5 choose 0 x to the fifth power plus we're going to get 5 choose 1 times 2 to the first x to the fourth. We're going to get a 5 choose 2 x squared times x cubed. Sorry, 2 squared times x cubed. Then we get 5 choose 3, which is going to be 2 cubed x squared. We then get 5 choose 4 times 2 to the 4th x. And then lastly, we're going to get 5 choose 5. We then get 2 to the 5th and x to the 0. So I'm not even included at that time. And so then as we evaluate these things, these binomial coefficients, we can read off the fifth row of Pascal's triangle, which gives us 1 x to the 5th. We're then going to get uh, 5 times 2 to the first, which is 2, x to the fourth. Then we're going to get 5 choose 2, which is 10. 2 squared is 4. We get x cubed. Then the next one, we're going to get 5 choose 3, which is also 10. 2 cubed is 8. We get x squared. Uh, then 5 choose 4 is 5. You're going to get 2 to the uh, 2 to the fourth is 16, x. And then lastly, you're going to get 5 choose 5, which is 1, times 2 to the 5th, which is 32. And now if we simplify those coefficients one more time, we end up with x to the 5th plus 5 times 2 is 10, x to the 4th. Uh, add to that 4 times 10, which is 40, x to the 3rd. Then we're going to get 8 times 10, which is 80, x squared. Uh, then we're going to get 5 times 16, which is also 80. 80 times x, and then lastly, 32. And so this very last line written in blue is then the binomial expansion there, uh, for which we did it very, very quickly using the binomial theorem, assuming that we can compute all of the binomial coefficients. But if your exponent's not really big, you can actually compute all of these binomial coefficients very quickly from Pascal's triangle, because you need the whole row. And this is an example where the recursion actually makes the counting a lot, a lot easier. And so this notion of recursion is gonna help us lead into our next unit uh, of integers that we're gonna start considering in, in uh, lecture 19.